Good evening, everyone. Okay. Good evening. I think we're going to get started because we're streaming as well and people are watching us on their computers, so we should be prompt. Um, thank you all so much for coming out on this rainy, chilly night. Um, I'm Lisa Krasner. I'm the Edward W. Kane Executive Director here at the Concord Museum. This is my sixth week at the museum, so I look forward to meeting so many of you, and I know a few familiar faces. Thank you. <laughs> So again, thank you for joining us tonight. We are here in the Churchill and Janet Franklin Lyceum and to all of our virtual viewers as well. Um, it's a true pleasure for me to introduce tonight's program with Gregory McGuire and Jared Bowen, uh, which is kicking off the 30th annual Concord Festival of Authors. Uh, over the next two weeks, there's some really wonderful programs happening all throughout town. And I encourage you to take a look at the calendar and attend as many as you can. There's a sheet on your chair. So uh, Gregory McGuire needs little introduction here in Concord. He is the New York Times bestselling author of several dozen fantasy books for adults and children, and is best known for writing Wicked, a bestseller adapted into one of the longest running plays in Broadway history. His most recent publication for adults is the second in the Another Day series, The Oracle of Morricor, which will be a topic of discussion in tonight's program. To facilitate that discussion, we're delighted to be joined by WGBH executive arts editor, Jared Bowen. We all know Jared as the host of the Emmy award-winning television series Open Studio with Jared Bowen, which takes viewers inside the creative process of artists in greater Boston, New England, and across the country. He's a contributor to GBH's nightly news magazine program, Greater Boston, and appears regularly on GBH to cover the latest happenings in the region's theater, art, music, dance, and film on GBH's Morning Edition and Boston Public Radio. He's very, very busy. So after the program, Thanks to our partnership with the Concord Bookshop, Gregory will be, jo will be signing copies of the Oracle of Marcor. And I will say a final thank you to our co-sponsors at the Umbrella Arts Center for hosting tonight's program with us. And now, please join me in welcoming Gregory McGuire and Jared Bowen. Can you hear us now? I'm already embarrassed. That's what you're supposed to feel like in your hometown, right? <laughs> what if I say something about the people whose backyard comes up against ours? I love their backyard. See, I'm practicing already to be good, you know. I wish there were more backyards that came up against ours there. That's, that's neighborliness. Hi, Jared. Hi, it's good to see you. So Oops. people may not realize, Gregory and I are friends. We've known each other for a long time. And so what I thought I would do tonight was ask you a bunch of things that I don't know the answers to. OK. And so, and I know you have things to tell me because we haven't talked in a while. That's true. You have a couple stories you want to tell me. So this will be like listening to Doris Day and Rock Hudson talk on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of the game plan for tonight's interview. So let me All right. start. Well, well, let me sit a little closer. <laughs> <laughs> so how old were you when you lost your uh, inhibitions about becoming an artist and a writer? That's a, that is a good question. And the truth is I never had any to lose. I was, I was a person who made things from, you know, the, my earliest memories really are of tucking my little squatty knees underneath our coffee table and getting paper and making, remember that homemade paste that you could make with water and flour, was it? Yeah, and we, you know, my mother would make up a pot of it and I would cut pictures out of the newspaper and make assemblages and try to make stories out of them. And this was before kindergarten, I think. So I was basically trying to get out of being put on a baseball team. <laughs> so I, I, I tried to exhibit great industry from a very early age. And a lot of it was a lie, but you know, you accidentally learn industry if you are pretending to be industrious. That's, that's, that was a flaw in the plan <laughs> that I hadn't figured out. But I really have been a maker of things uh, my whole life, including a writer of stories from the time I was about five. And were your parents encouraging of that? Deeply. 
And the reason is that there were seven children in, and uh, a grandmother and two parents in a house that was really suitable to, to contain four people. <laughs> and so any time my parents could see that at least one of their miscreants was not getting in trouble, you know, they blessed that and just went on to the next kid. Um, my father was a journalist at, in the Albany Times Union, and he wrote, in addition to doing human interest stories, he wrote uh, sort of Garrison Keillor-esque stories about town. Albany is a place of great, uh, many great satisfactions. It's actually a very beautiful little city, and you may remember that Isabel Archer from Portrait of a Lady was born in Albany, so that gives it at least a little cred. Um, <laughs> And uh, he was a human interest journalist and a, and a comic journalist and a reporter as well. So the example of him working all the time to support 10 people uh, was an example that I took in. When he was almost dying, and we had not always had the best, you know, you can imagine. But when he was almost dying, I went and I said, you know, Daddy, I have to say something nice to you because you're almost dying. <laughs> and it's about time. <laughs> you know, so I want to tell you that you've really affected my life. I didn't think I was going to be telling this story this early in the night. But anyway, I said, you've really affected my life. Um, you've been a really model parent. Because whenever I've gotten into a moral dilemma, I have thought to myself, what would daddy do? And then I've done the opposite. <laughs> so you've really shaped my character in the most magnificent way. And I, you know, he laughed because he told jokes, but we both knew that I was telling the truth. <laughs> I had taken a different path from, from his. Later on, though, after he died, in the way that one has that opportunity, I realized that two of his greatest characteristics were his loyalty to his family and his children, and there had been a, you know, some tragedy in our family, so there had to be loyalty, and, and he exhibited it. But also industry, because he never stopped working till the week before he died. He was a little bit like the queen, yeah. <laughs> I'll, 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 only he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't live that long. <laughs> yeah. did, did they live long enough to see your success? My, my stepmother, who raised me, was able to come to Broadway the, you know, the night the play opened. And uh, I, after we went to Tavern on the Green with the cast in this giant stretch limo, basically you climbed in the front door and then walked through the limo to get out the back door and you were at the Tavern on the Green. You didn't have to drive down any avenues. Um, but, um, but I said, I went hunting through the crowd and I grabbed Kristen Chenoweth and I said, you have to come, you have to come meet my my mother, my, my second mother is the term of art we used because she really did raise me from the orphanage on up to, to, um, to the time she died. And so I grabbed Chris and Jenna. She was talking to 300 people who were hanging on every word. But she said, I must, I must. And we flew through the crowds. And I took her to my mother. And I said, Mom, here, I want you to meet. And she said, it's Judith Regan, your editor. Judith, how smart you are. And I said, no, 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 it's Galinda. <laughs> so, but Kristen was so charming, she sat right down, almost in her lap, and began you know, to sing to her, and everything calmed down nicely. And you're, you're, you're still friends with Kristen Chenoweth. Oh, yes. I mean, Kristen Chenoweth and Adina Menzel, who were the two leads, in Wicked, um, and they're here tonight. No, just kidding. <laughs> 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 um, they. When I met them, I didn't. I, I knew their names, but not much else. And we were all. I mean, we weren't. You know, just starting out. Kristen had already won a Tony, and Adina had already been in Rent. But in a way, we were sort of at, at a very bouncy point in our careers, where it was going to be interesting to see what kind of leverage would happen if this show was a success. And so we all kind of experienced the leverage in the, the same high helium way with a great deal of thrill. Ever since, though, if I'm ever any place where one of them is singing, or if there's ever a wicked family reunion, which happens from time to time, they are like first cousins. 
You know, I don't know. We have a lot to talk about in terms of Hollywood stars and the difference between the public personas of Hollywood stars and the kind of magnetic charm they radiate and the way theater people are. And, I, you know, it's about time for me to ask you to unpack that one. But <laughs> I, I really do think the people I've met who came up in theater, just my ex limited experience in the world, are so much more real. Because when I, when I take my kids, for instance, there was a 15th anniversary CBS viewing uh, show about Wicked on Broadway for 15 years. And I took my three kids, and they were, you know, the boys wore suit coats and jackets, which they never do, not even for Easter. It's like, Jesus, oh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. You'll wear it for the witches, but not for Jesus Christ. You died for your sins. Come on. I, I did something wrong here. <laughs> However, they, you know, and my daughter Helen, whom you've met, is, is petite. So we, we go into, we go backstage, we go into, Kristen's dressing room, and uh, Kristen greets them, and so does Adina in the next dressing room. Um, they're not sharing a dressing room, <laughs> yeah, but they greet them because they've known them since they were three and four and five, and they greet them like they're their own nieces and nephews, and like, and oh, and, and hugs and hugs, and my kids just feel like, <gasps> you know, <laughs> just so thrilled. And and Kristen looked at Helen, who had got a new dress for this occasion, and as I said, Helen is petite. And Kristen said, oh, I love that dress. I, lo I love that dress. We're the same size. Give it to me. <laughs> and, you know, they just, you know, everybody laughs. And they're, but they're just, so, they're just so real and attached. Now, contrast that for us, if you will, Jared, in your many experiences talking and interviewing with movie people, and am I making a correct no, assessment? You are. It's because I've, I've thought a lot about this, actually, and, and I'll back up to say for Angela Lansbury just died this mm. week, which is sad, but she was 96, so she had a great life, yeah. and I met her once, and she was the most lovely, down-to-earth, grounded person, another yeah. theater person, yeah. that's why, right. and I think, and I, I was really interested to read that at one point, she, a couple points during her career, she gave up her career. One, to take care of her husband when he was ailing. Uh -huh. And then I think their kids had drug problems from being in Los Angeles. Oh, and so oh yeah. They, they, she, they, she and her husband took them to Ireland to, to kind of remedy the situation, and they did. And I think that's the key. If you escape Hollywood, where everything is very artificial, uh -huh. and everything is, if you're around it at all, or anybody, is anybody around this? You're not, I mean, you, you kind of get a sense of what happens, and everything is taken care of yeah. for you. Yeah. You don't pay, it's, you're like the queen. You don't pay your own money. People do that for you. You have cars that yeah. take you everywhere. Yeah. I mean, everything is done for you, so you're not living in a reality. And I think that's what happens to people. Unless yeah. they escape, Meryl Streep escaped, yeah. then they're not real anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you know, it's, it's, I mean, I haven't met enough Hollywood people to, you know, to be able to add that up, but the theater people I've met, and I've met a few, and the theater people just are so much more like, well, you know, if you hang around for 20 minutes, you know, we can go out for a drink. And like, they actually say things like that. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I can, that's beyond my bedtime, so I never do, but it's nice to be asked. <laughs> but you're about to meet all the movie people. <laughs> oh, I am about to meet all the movie people. Before that, I have to we talk about Hollywood. Oh, okay, okay. We were in, um, I, I was out on the West Coast a couple of weeks ago. I love to say that, though it only happens about once every eight years. But I, <laughs> but I happened to be out there for a wedding, and I got a room in the Beverly Hills Hotel. Oh, this is a story he, I've been dying. Yes. He wouldn't tell me until we were until you were all here. Yeah, this is yeah, how I yeah, get to hear yeah. the story. Well, I can only tell part of the story <laughs> in public. <laughs> no. but, but the thing is, it, 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 it's the glossy um, candy coating of the ego that happens in Hollywood. You can, you can feel it. What you are coming down when you're flying from the East Coast, you are not coming down through smog, you're coming down through crystal meth or something, I don't know, and you land on the ground and the world is so different, and the world, the people in that world are so impressed with themselves. Um, I mean, I, I, I was impressed with myself too, I mean, they, they let me get off the plane, that was like a start, but I, I took a car and I went to the Beverly Hills Hotel, because I had some um, meetings with studio execs. <laughs> And so I get my room, and they walk me down the hall, and they open up the room, and they say, and this is your room. And it was a room. It wasn't as big as this room, but it was a big room. And they say, here's your terrace. Here's your private terrace. Uh, and here's the air conditioning 
uh, and it was 110 degrees out, out the door. And it was so cold, I couldn't get the air conditioning down. So I had to put on the gas fire <laughs> so I wouldn't freeze to death in the Beverly Hills Hotel when it was 110 degrees out. But the thing that was the most glossy and that if I, if I didn't think I had a, a fairly flinty New England character, or at least I pretend to, on the desk, there was a tray about the size of this tabletop, and the tray was covered with a giant glass dome with a handle. And underneath the, tr the, tr the glass was, were about 15 handmade chocolates, different kinds of things, chocolate bark with pistachios, and little chocolate nougats and fondants, and whatever they're called. It was, they were delicately and preciously arranged, and around them, interspersed them, there were about nine placards of illustrations and text from my most recent children's book called Crass Watercrass. And I picked it up. I, I looked at it. I said, what is this doing here? And, and the, lady, the lady who showed me the room said, oh, did we put that in the wrong room? I said, no, no, it's mine. But I didn't order this. And she said, no, welcome <laughs> to the Beverly Hills Hotel. And I said, but this is my book. And she said, yes, and it's edible. <laughs> and it was. I could pick up chapter one. It was, it was white chocolate. <laughs> I think it reads better than it ate. But that's just me, you know. So, but the thing is, I floated up and down. I, I became on a first name basis with all the waiters and the bellboys and the girls behind the front desk because I didn't dare talk to anybody else. <laughs> Everyone was so, so beautiful, so, so filled with awareness of their own beauty that I just decided I have to be, I'm just, I have to take on a new role. I'm going to be a very important East Coast filmmaker that is about to make his big comeback, and I'm looking for beautiful people to be in my film. So I kind of grouched, I sort of Walter Matthaued my way around the place, and, uh, but it was a big sham. So I don't know, how do you manage it when you go out there? Well, you're beautiful, so yeah, forget it. We don't, we don't have to even go there. I don't want to know how you manage it. <laughs> but you're about to be in this world because Wicked yeah. is coming out in 2024. I think so, yeah. Does everybody know this? The musical is being turned into a film, and it's going to be told in two parts, uh, December of 2024, holidays, and then, again, the second part will come out. The second half of uh, the second half will come out 2025. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah he thinks that's right. <laughs> well, you know, I rely on you to get my Hollywood news because nobody ever tells me anything. But so, what is this experience like to see this? I mean, you've been on this entire journey. Your book becomes a musical, becomes this icon. Now it's going to become a film. Well, the journey so far has not, for me, has not left Logan. You know, the runways at Logan Airport, but it will. They're going to start doing principal photography in um, either late December or early January. And I said, well, I'll, I, I want to come over. And if, if I can get my COVID clearance, I want to come onto the Universal Studios set. They have a new, a new Universal Studios in London, and this is apparently the first thing that's going to be filmed there. Um, so I hope they get the right light bulbs. Uh, <laughs> but they, um, But I've been told by Universal... Don't come, this is going to be a long shoot. This is going to take eight months. So don't come the first month. Give everybody a chance to learn to work together and then show up. And maybe you can show up when people need an inocu you know, not, a, not a COVID inoculation, but sort of, you know, to be buoyed up a little bit because people will be excited that, you, that you've come. But, so I don't know. I just know about the casting. I know about three, three pieces of casting and what will be a cast of about 15 principles and, and secondaries. And the, the casting, which it, it, people who follow entertainment news will know, Alphaba, the Wicked Witch of the West, is going to be played by Cynthia Erivo. Who's fabulous. Who's fabulous. That's what everybody says. I never yeah. saw her live, so yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Do you know her? She is amazing. Yeah. An endorsement. Okay, let me text, let me text Universal and <laughs> tell them she's in. <laughs> <laughs> They've been waiting. They've been waiting for the for the conquered vote. Um, 
<laughs> but I hear she's wonderful. Yeah, I hear yeah. I hear she's wonderful. And what, what did you see her in? Did you see I, her in The Color I, Purple, maybe? I saw her in The Color Purple. That's the only thing I've seen her in. Yeah. Because most of what she's done has been, I think, in the West End. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 And she's very talented on screen, too. I think she's real. You think? Oh, good. I oh, good. Her, but I think she's uh, real. Oh, good, good. Well, I'll get back to you if she okay, isn't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can punch her up in we'll the alley. <laughs> <laughs> and then, And then Glinda, Galinda... Galinda, Glinda, is Ariana Grande. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, um, and, and she, too, is about the size of my daughter. She's yeah. absolutely tiny. And apparently, she saw Wicked on Broadway when she was about eight. And that was one of the things that motivated her to want to be a singer and be, be in entertainment. And she's an old friend of Kristen Chenoweth's. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Kristen Chenoweth gave her, you know, singing tips when when she was young and helped helped her, her come up. And then she Betty Davis her <laughs> <laughs> took the role. Yeah. Well, Kristen Chenoweth used to say, Gregory, if they don't start filming this movie, I'm going to have to play Madame Morrible. <laughs> and it's true, she has aged out of the ingenue, but, uh, you know, she'd be welcome in any position. And then your favorite for Fierro, very talented actor, Jonathan Bailey. I never heard of him, but he's, well, he's, Jared A has. lot of people have because he's in Bridgerton now. But before that, he was in Broadchurch on Masterpiece. Yeah, he was the young reporter. This yeah. is a very knowledgeable crowd. <laughs> <laughs> At the Q&A time, I'm going to ask you questions about who this Jonathan Bailey is. Because Jared seems very impressed. I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't done my IMBD research yet. But. He's very talented. Actually, yeah. he, was, he just won the, uh, the Olivier for, for the revival of Company. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, OK. Yep. So you can hear him on the cast album. Oh, good. We're not talking a lot about your writing tonight. And you're well, we will. We will. Here. There's lots of books. But we'll get to that because it's actually all part of the same story. But I will say the one, the one role I've been waiting and waiting and waiting for them to cast is Madame Marble. Now, I have, you know, Madame Marble is the headmistress at the university where Alphabet and Glinda meet. And she ends up having actually being a kind of perestrophist or a turncoat. And she's in league with the wicked Wizard of Oz. So that's a, an arc that, if you hadn't noticed this yet, well, now I've just ruined the whole story for you. But, <laughs> but she, so she, she's a baddie. And when I was writing the book, more than 25 years ago. Uh, it was the biggest, it was the, my first adult novel, because I'd only written children's novels before that. And there was such a large cast of characters in it that I cast a kind of filmic version in my mind so that I could keep the characters straight. And, you know, I could figure out how they would talk and how they would move. And I was not expecting that it would be a, published, B, made into a play, or C, made into a movie. I was just trying to do my job, because it was eight times longer than anything I'd written before and more complicated. Um, so in, the, in, my, in my mental cast, I had Katie Lang playing Alphaba. <laughs> yeah, Katie Yang, Lang, when she was like in the barber's chair, you know, with her <laughs> short hair. And her, she's so beautiful and so spiky and so non-traditionally beautiful which is what I loved about her. And of course, she can sing. Yeah. And I always knew Elphaba could sing. She sings in Wicked, I think, on three different <laughs> episodes, three different uh, moments in the, in the book, because I knew it was important that if she had a voice, that was one voice that wasn't going to be silenced. I never knew she was going to become a meme, but, uh, <laughs> but I had her sing. And Gal Glinda, in my mind, was played by Michelle Griffith, uh, you know, Melanie work, Griffith. working girl, Mel, Mel, yeah, Melanie Griffith, Griffith. Yeah. working girl, Kirk's girl, hee, you know, like uh, high voice and a little, a little ditzy and a little competent and, and a little out there. And so that was, you know, that was easy for me to get Melanie Griffith yeah. and Katie Lang, like in my head, talking to each other, you know, uh, as I was writing these, this dialogue. But the Madame Morrible part in my head was played by Angela Lansbury. I was thinking uh, she was wow. she was uh, she was the um, I probably I, at that point had I seen yes that I had seen um, Sweeney Todd so I knew she had the capacity to have that wicked mischief in her in her eyes. Um, but she was Madame Marble through the whole book and all this time that we've been waiting for the green light from Universal to do the film I'd been hoping the queen 
of Broadway, the queen of Hollywood, the queen of Shiz University can be <laughs> Angela Lansbury, the way I pictured it almost 30 years ago. And then there was news she was getting sick and getting, getting close to death. And then I thought, well, if she, if she passes away, the other queen can do it, the queen of England. <laughs> that would be great. She doesn't have a long commute. She doesn't have many lines. And she, too, can look kind of fierce. <laughs> and she was great in the Paddington video. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that, that is um, the, the, movie, the movie part will be interesting. But so far, I wish I had luscious tidbits of you know, like stage gossip and stuff to tell you about. But I, I, really, I really don't too much because nothing's happened yet. But I'll phone it in when it does. You know? <laughs> I have my father's journalist genes in me, and I'll, I'll phone it in. How much money have you made off Wicked? Oh, <laughs> that's a question you always ask. Oh, did I? Have I asked that before? I like to tell people the dump truck full of all the Wicked money <laughs> yeah. pulls up to his house every Thursday, just dumps the yep, money. Yep, yep. And it comes back the next Thursday. Dumps Would money. that it were true? I've had some very, very good luck in my life. Um, Really good luck in, in almost all aspects of my life, I, I, I like to think. Um, but signing exactly the right contract was not one of those pieces of good luck. <laughs> Does that make any difference to me? You know, it really doesn't. No. It really doesn't. I mean, I have enough, and that's what you want. So here's something I haven't asked you. So many writers, almost every single writer I've ever interviewed has said that their work mostly, even though it wouldn't appear so, is autobiographical. How much is that the case for your work? I think, in order to answer this question honestly, I have to go back and, and sort of tease out a little bit of what I mentioned earlier. That I was raised by a stepmother. And that's because my own mother, who was an immigrant, died in childbirth when I was born. I had three older brothers and sisters. My father was unemployed at that point. So when, when I was born, my mother died. He had four children under the age of eight and no job. And so uh, he parceled his children out to my mother's sisters, well, living in the same neighborhood because they're Greeks. That's what Greeks do. And, uh, and I was with an aunt for about six months, and then she got pregnant. And she said to my father, either you have to let me adopt him, or you have to take him away, because I'm not going to be able to spend a year and a half with a child this age and then give them up. I'm just, I just can't do it. Uh, so that's, when, that's how I got to the orphanage. Um, and I was in an orphanage for an undisclosed amount of time. Uh, nobody's ever really said. So I think probably a little bit longer than quite needed to be. But that was how people did things in those days. And then my father was able to marry again. And he married my birth mother's best friend from fourth grade. So my birth mother and my second mother knew each other for ten, for 10 or 15 years longer than my father had known his wife. They were, they were, you know, it's the kind of thing, if it were in an Irish peasant village or a Greek village, my father would have married his dead wife's sister. But all the sisters were already married. So he married her best friend, who was unmarried. And she was a wonderful mother. And she, she and my father shared a great love for literature, a great suspicion of television and of popular culture. <laughs> We kept the, the dictionary on the shelf with the two cookbooks. It was in the kitchen so that we could reach it quickly. And the atmosphere was perfect for, for growing writers. In fact, three of my siblings are writers, too. So we, you know, we, I, I lost the track of, of the question you asked. Though. <laughs> so, oh, yes. So the autobiographical part is that it is hard for me to conceive of anything being a story. And I've written, I think, 40 books now uh, from in, over the last 45 years, well, just about one a year. And it's hard for me to conceive of any story that begins with two intact parents, mm -hmm. e even if it's a story for adults. It's almost as if, if you have two intact parents, you're at the happily ever after part. You know, you've already got there. There's nothing more. There's nothing more to say about life if you get to what it is that you need. And so Elphaba shows up on the scene. And by the time she gets to college, her mother has died. And most of the characters in my books have, most of them have a dead mother. Some have a dead father. Um, some, you know, sometimes somebody's in the hospital or, you know, 
plane went to the wrong country or something. <laughs> but you know, the, it, it, it's so I'd say in that part, yeah, the idea of recognizing that a kind of a kind of tear and a, and a potentially fatal tear in your own understanding of your own life can be so excruciating and, so, and, and from which one might not be able to recover that A, it, it changed the kind of stories that actually even seemed like <laughs> stories to me, and B, I do think it is one of my motivations for being a novelist. Because what is a novelist? What is any storyteller but someone who says, this is a rotten world and I have to revise it one book at a time. I have to prove to myself and to people one story at a time that courage is important and tenacity is important and you can work through whatever brambles and thickets of fairy tales or dragons with, with red flame coming out or madam marbles. You can work through it. You can get there. I think that I'm a functional adult because I had story for self-therapy. I think that's why I wanted to make things. I wanted to revise the world to make it safe for me to be in. Do you go back now and read passages or read your entire books of the earlier books? Uh, no. Uh, now, no, there's not even a peek. Uh, well, if I'm doing a little research on something that I've written about before, I, I will go back. Uh, when I do look at it, I'm glad I don't have an instant inclination to vomit, uh, <laughs> which is you know what one always worries about. But the act of writing, like any art, and I think it's, this is true of performing arts as well as you know the the plastic arts, let's call them. Um, the act of making something is always about engaging in the world now. Now, now, now. If you did you know, Faust yesterday, you are a different Faust today on the stage because of that salami sandwich you had <laughs> you know, at 12.30 when you usually try to stop eating by 11. You, know? you just are a different person. You're engaging with the world now. And that's why we go to art, I think, and those of us who consume it, which is everybody, and that's also why we make it for those of us who make it. It's a, it's a trick to engage in the world in this wonderful, befuddling, dangerous, treacherous, horrible, rotten, unjust world. It allows us to engage in it as deeply as we can. First of all, I understand that. I can't watch myself, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to, I was wondering if you would ever peek back to, to learn more about yourself. Um, who needs that? <laughs> yeah, the other, the other truth is, you know, uh, uh, does anybody, anybody know the magazine called The Week? Yeah. The, 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 well, this past week, The Week wrote to me and said, we have this little column, and people who have new books out sometimes are asked to supply six books that are your favorites. And I said, are they supposed to be like hoity-toity New York Times, what's on my bedside table um, <laughs> books? Because I never believe a word of what people say. You know, well, I have a dictionary of Pictish Proto-Saxon, you know, <laughs> next to Julia Child's memoirs written in Hittite, you know. And it's like, are you kidding me? I don't, I don't buy it. So he said, no, no, either favorite books or influential books. So I did a combination of both. One of the first ones that I named, which comes out on October 21st, one of the first ones is The Once and Future King, because that was, I think, a model, subconsciously a model for the audacity it would take to enter into a great story like The Wizard of Oz and say, I can tell this story too. That, that was a model. But another book that's a real formative book and one of my favorite books of all time is Harriet the Spy, which I read when I was 12. And when you say, do you ever look back, I, I say rarely, but Harry the Spy taught me to you know, train that impulse of writing into also an impulse for observing. And you observe when you're a kid, you observe out because you haven't really been able to construct a mental image of the shape of your own character or ego or where you're going or where you've been. But as you get older, it, be, it becomes more inward, and you begin to examine your reactions. Like, why did I lean over and punch Jared Bowen the way Will Smith <laughs> you know, punched Chris Rock? Why did I do that right then? I better write about it in my journal, and so maybe I can find out. 
I started writing a journal, a spy notebook, as I called it, when I was 12, and I'm still doing it, and I'm almost 70. So I don't look back, but that's because I don't have time. I'm still trying to figure out what I don't know about the world today as it's changing, and about myself, who, it, who I'm changing too. You just mentioned having the audacity to go into the world of <laughs> Oz. Okay, yeah. so we've talked a little bit about this, yes. but you look back on it now, and that was pretty ballsy to do what you did to take something like that and, and make it your own. I, I thought I was going to be, you know, made to leave the country. You know, uh, you know the the uh, playing with a sacred cow like the Wizard of Oz. I I knew a lot of people were going not to like it. And really only one person didn't like it loudly. And that was the New York Times reporter who reviewed it in 16 column inches uh, the day it was, came out. Her name will not be mentioned, but it was Michiko Kakatani. Uh, <laughs> and she's won a Nobel Prize for book criticism or something. She's very influential and very important. I actually don't think she knows what fiction is, but that's a separate matter. <laughs> She basically wrote in this, in this famous review that my husband has refused out of solidarity ever to read, you know, that basically this was the worst novel she'd ever read in her life of reading, and that if I was seen crossing, you know, West 48th Street, <laughs> she had, they had my permission to run me over with, the, with their panel truck. Did she really say that? No, but that's... That, <laughs> That was, that was the effect of it on me. <laughs> um, so I was so like... So basically she said, it's okay. It, it, was, it was pretty bad. Uh, but, but I won't go any further to that. Every other review was either starred or, or great. And, I mean, and the, that, the, her review came out on a Thursday. And I thought, oh, my career is over. My, and I've, I've, I've published a grown-up novel. I knew nobody was going to like it. She took, she took offense at my sniping at the sacred cow of The Wizard of Oz, which is where your question came from. And I thought, all right, well, I knew there might be just 10 people in the country who liked The Once and Future King and might like you know, this kind of thing, too. And then it just began to, to, it didn't hit the bestseller list for about five years, but it was that rare book that was word of mouth. And every six months, it sold more than the six months before, rather than the other way around. And that went, well, that was true for about 12 years. It just was like, whoa, you know, we, we don't have enough paper, you know, in this country to keep reprinting this book. Uh, when that, and that was, that was wonderful. But, but working with a sacred cow, I really thought this might be the end of my, this might be the end of my career, but it's what I want to do. I wanted to think about, I really wanted to think about evil, and I really wanted to think about scapegoating. It seemed really urgent to me in that moment in my life to see if I could understand something about it. There's probably a moment in the country's life, too, in the world's life, yeah. that, that it was okay in the end for the themes that you addressed. Oh, it was, you know, so Wicked came out in 97. It was optioned by Hollywood, like, about 15 minutes after the, the L.A. Times review came out, because people in L.A. don't read books, but they sure read newspapers, <laughs> and the phone was ringing off the hook the day after the Sunday Times put... A glowing view of Wicked, first review of the section above the fold on the front page. And so Whoopi Goldberg called, and Demi Moore called, and Laurie Metcalf called, and you know, I, I didn't have enough phones to keep picking, <laughs> picking up the calls. Uh, and it was optioned very quickly. Um, but so I, I could tell that somehow I had, it wasn't just. Yeah, sure, it was popular culture. But it wasn't just popular culture. It was what I was trying to use this convenient armature. It was the clothes I was trying to hang on the hanger that was, I think, really important. And a lot of people just thought, oh, the witch, yeah, you know, and didn't, didn't kind of care whether I was trying to tell them something real. But I was trying to tell them something real. Then 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 happened, Wicked the novel had been out for about four years. And we had already begun the conversion process into thinking, maybe it shouldn't be a movie. Maybe it should be a play. Maybe it should be a play where people sing their inner feelings and their inner emotions. Stephen Schwartz was the one who had that idea, and he convinced Universal Studios. He said, you know, ever since 1939, people in America and all around the world know that everybody in Oz sings. That's why you can't get a good shooting script, because people have to sing. It should be a play first, and then we can make it into a movie. And Mark Platt said, 
you're going to have to convince Gregory about that because he, he manages the rights. So Stephen Schwartz and I met at Andy's family farm in Connecticut, undisclosed location. And I said to Andy, I know who Stephen Schwartz is. I mean, you know. But we're just going to go for a walk. He's going to try to talk me into this. And the payoff is going to be much, much lower than if Universal buys outright for seven figures. It's going to be pennies, pennies, peanuts on, on a purchase price. So Stephen Schwartz went, I've already, I've already told you these stories, I'm sorry. I don't know if I know them. Well, Stephen Schwartz and I went walking through the woods and it was like the spy who came in from the cold. You know, we were, it was gray. We had fedoras, you know. And he was trying to convince me that I didn't need seven figures of income from Universal. I just needed like $35,000 for the rights to sell it for a Broadway play. And I, I had three adopted kids, and they were young, and I had, you know, and I was like, are you sure I don't want the seven-figure <laughs> seven salary? And he said, I'm so convinced. He said, for one thing, you know people sing. You know that the, your characters have this 19th century pre-Freudian intensity. They're not understanding all their emotions and feelings the way Freud would have us. They're doing it the way Tolstoy would have us do it. That's what you'd, you've given us. You've given us a 19th century novel in late 20th century garb. And the, the, the backs and forths of the moral conundrums that people are in are deep and are serious. And what music will allow one to do, he said, is a character like Alphaba can, can walk out on the stage and the lights can go down and when she sings her inner feelings, she will be communicating to every single person in the room because of the music that will come up under, because of the melody. That's what music does. That's why there is musical theater. The contact is much more immediate and much more moving than if you're standing at a cineplex and seeing this giant green skin you know, face making you wish you hadn't had that salami sandwich. Um, <laughs> and I thought, well, I mean, I think about it now. And I think at a certain point. Alpha becomes to the edge of the stage, and she's, you know, lights go down, and she says, Unlimited, my future is unlimited, and I've just seen a vision almost like a prophecy. I know it sounds truly crazy and true. The vision's hazy, but I swear someday there'll be a celebration throughout Oz that's all to do with Adina Menzel. But you get the picture. <laughs> you get the picture. And, and I got... I got, I got the picture too. I mean, after all, you know, I was I, I'm born with a Scottish Presbyterian face, and and I have a lawyer for a husband, but I'm a gay man, and so like blow it away, you know, what's not to love? But but here here's here was the the final clincher though, as we're as we're, we're walking, and he says he's he's beginning to get nervous because I do have this, you know, I have my father's, and. Uh, he said, I'm so convinced, Gregory, that you are going to see the rightness of my idea that I will admit to you I have already written the first song. And I've already conceived it. And he, he has said to me this wasn't true, but this is how I remember it. So this is what's going in my, in my memoir. Uh, he said to me, I know he used these words. He said, Glinda will, Glinda will appear and the witch will have, you know, be gone. And the first song that will be sung will be the minute after the witch has been killed, and it will be called No One Mourns the Wicked. No One Mourns the Wicked. And with those five words, he closed the deal. Because with those five words, he proved to me he knew why I had written the book. I had not written the book so it could be a Saturday Night Live skit making fun of something that we all loved. I had written it because I wanted to take something we all loved and use it to help unpack other things that we really needed to think about. And so I, you know, I didn't tell him for about a year and a half till the contract negotiation was done, <laughs> but basically he closed the deal that day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, something else I was wondering, as I've talked to other artists, something that surprised me for the number of years I have been interviewing artists, that 
they they release their work into the world at some point. After, basically, if it leaves their studio, a painting leaves their studio, yeah. or a sculpture is a, planted in a public park and people want to engage with it differently, or a city decides it should be in a different kind of conversation with another piece, they're fine with it yeah. after it's left their studio. Do you feel the same, that, that once your work leaves, once it's embraced by young women all over the world, or Stephen Schwartz <laughs> yeah, yeah. has a very particular idea about it, that it's not necessarily yours anymore? I, I think it possibly what happens is a, a, a faint kind of superficial schizophrenia sets in, because it both is yours and isn't yours. You know, certainly when it gets to Broadway and it has $17 million budget behind it, it its bones are definitely mine, the characters are mine, and the basic architecture of Elphaba's you know, innocent beginnings and her sad uh, ending is mine, but they take different paths and they collapse characters and collapse timelines in order to get there. Um, but I can keep both in my head at the same time. Um, and once in a while, I want to take back a little of what has been done to my story, which is more a tragedy than it is a melodrama. The Broadway show makes it bittersweet, but my novel, Wicked, was a tragedy like King Lear. It was the death of somebody who died too young. And, and Broadway tweaked that just a little <laughs> bit. Um, and, I'm okay with that because the basic messages of both pieces, the, the, the play of the, of the play, the story of the play and the story of my novel, basically are trying to convey the same important messages and they just get to it through different itineraries. And yet, yes, it is still the landscape in my head that generated that with everybody else's input. And that landscape is still available to me. And that's a, a, an unclumsy segue to the Oracle of Maricourt. Um, <laughs> because there you see over there, this is the, the middle book in, in a trilogy of three books that is about the Wicked Witch of the West's granddaughter named Rain. And that is why she's green on the cover of this book because um, the green skin conveys through the matrilineal line. And her father, Lear, the witch's only child, was not green. So she was born green. And my last book in the Wicked Years was published in 2010. So how long goes that? Uh, and I said, I left Rain, the granddaughter, flying out of Oz on, on her grandmother's broom over an ocean that very few people even knew existed. Um, you know, basically Oz was a little bit like Kansas and that was completely landlocked and nobody really had ever seen an ocean and it was kind of considered to be a mythological construct. But Rain found the actual ocean to the west and she flew out over it. And that was where my, you know, almost 2,000 page saga ended with Rain flying into her future. And then what happened? Well main thing that happened is that my little Helen began to grow up. And when she was 10, she had 10-year-old problems. And when she was 18, she had 18-year-old problems. And then the pandemic came down to settle upon her and on my other children while she was in her first year of college. And she had to come home. And like many parents, we had to look and see what can we do what can we do for their safety and well-being and health? The first thing we can do is pour a bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing we can do is take care of ourselves. Because if we're not mentally sound, if we get too panicked, if we get too house crazy, cabin feverish, by not being able to go out, we are going to be bad role models for them, and we are not going to be able to work with them, to keep them safe. So suddenly, I began to think, I mean, this is like sequestration, as I called it, started about March 17th, 2020, or 15th, around there. I had the idea for the Brides of Maricor by about March 21st. Mm -hmm. And it was partly, I now realize, it was partly because if I couldn't be sure that I could even keep Helen alive and her brothers for a year or two, I was going to have to displace my parental anxiety 
in a, in a more useful way. So I began to worry about rain. Where is she? Why didn't she get the 1130 train? You know, she's out over the ocean on a broom. And 10 years later, I, I, I needed to find her. And I needed to see if she was OK. I didn't necessarily need to rescue her. I just was being a helicopter parent. <laughs> I needed to check in on her. And the oracle of Maricourt, and if you see the cover here with the broom on, uh, on the front, that's Elphaba's broom, the, the oracle of Maricourt is the book in which she begins to recover from the amnesia that has beset her when she has crash landed into, into the ocean um, uh, and, and survived in, in an amnesiacal form to find herself in a place very, very different from Oz, really more like late, um, late classical Rome or, or Greece. Um, that's never heard. It's a little bit like what eighth century Japan might have thought about, you know, eighth century Belgium. You know, it's like they don't compute. They, they, they didn't know they were both there. And so, so I've, I've, I put rain without the strength of family, without the strength of even any self-knowledge because she suffered amnesia in the crash. And she's in a world that doesn't look like anything she knows. And that's where our children were at the beginning of the pandemic. And that is why, again, I had to use my storytelling skills to survive the world that we all had to survive. Other people really preferred the bourbon. <laughs> and I, you know, I like bourbon too. But I, that is why I went back to this constructed landscape that is just about as big as the world in which we live now. So. Well, you're going to be signing those in a couple uh, yeah, minutes. Right. But, but before, yeah, yeah. I think we have time for just a few questions. I'm getting the yes. We have time for, OK, yes. Who has questions? Please. Right in the front row. What a delightful talk this has been. Oh, thank you. I've got a couple, two questions. One. Uh, how much of your Greek lineage has informed your view of drama and comedy and tragedy? And the other question is... I'll repeat you, the question. I hear you, the whispering. When you were thinking about, about how did Oz come to you, the Wizard of Oz, as opposed to, I don't know, Huckleberry Finn? Oh, so the two questions were the, the impact of your Greek lineage, right. your storytelling, and then why Oz as opposed to, in this example, any other piece of literature like Huck Finn? Yeah, those are, that's a really good question. And the Greek lineage thing is, um, I mean, that's, a really, that's really important because, of course, my mother was the Greek one. And she died, and I was raised by an Irish Catholic uh, second mother with an Irish Catholic father. And yet my Irish Catholic second mother taught herself how to make baklava, taught herself how to make moussaka, and she did the things that she could do to bring the cult. You know, she had grown up in the house of her best friend. You know, she'd eaten all this food as a child herself, but she taught herself to give us what she could. And so the Greek heritage, I think, is a little bit like, like the reading of fairy tales. It's like something that you almost dream about because I have it I have it genetically, but I don't have it practically. I've had to I've had to invent it. I go to Greece every year now and I speak a little Greek. So uh, you know I've I've tried to make it more and more real. But uh, but that but it existed as a kind of tissue of imaginary uh, constructs including including drama, including theater. I came to that very late, including even Homer I read late. It's more like, I haven't read it yet, but it's there. And I stand against it, like I stand against this, you know, these trees. It's just there. And to, that it was there, and that I could claim some ownership of it, even if I didn't have the right passport, was a kind of liberation for me. Another one. I'm always looking for liberations. And the second question you asked was about why The Wizard of Oz rather than Huck Finn. Why was that the armature that I chose? Well, I had been thinking on and off about writing about evil or writing about you know, something more serious than my children's books uh, allowed me to do. And then there was this terrible death. You probably remember it, I think, in Manchester or Birmingham where a, a two-year-old boy was kidnapped and murdered by a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old. This was about this was about 92, oh, and I, in England. And I was living in England at the time. And um, 
and the boys, first, it was, first there was a missing child, then there was a manhunt, then the video film saw this little boy being brought away by school boys, middle school and grade school. And so then there was a boy hunt, and when the boys were found, their identities were revealed into the papers. Um, actually, on the basis of this particular case, the laws in England changed to protect the identity of minors. But at this point, they were open. So we read, everybody read who the boys were and how their, what their relationship was like, what their family lives had been like. And we all sat down the way you do when you're a freshman in college or a sophomore, and you sit down with a beer and you think, how could two boys wake up in the morning, decide whether to have Weetabix or toast and Marmite for breakfast, and become murderers by evening? How, what does that say about human character? What does it say about even what evil is? How responsible were they? How responsible were their parents? How culpable, how sick? Where was God? Where are, the, where are the guardian angels? Where was the state? Where were the other parents? You know, we, the questions are unanswerable, but they must be asked. They must be asked. Otherwise, we run the risk of being equally menacing. We have to ask those questions so that we can protect other people from our own worst instincts. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to examine concepts of evil and questions about evil. And so at first I thought, I'll write a novel about Hitler. And I, I'll use, I'll use my, my great intuitive brain, and I will finally discover why Hitler was so evil. Nobody's been able to tell it yet. But I'll be able to dream it up, and it'll be a novel. And um, that lasted about 20 minutes, because I knew I couldn't learn German. And I thought, well, everybody says, writers always say, write what you know. And I think, what do I know? I know, I know church music. You know. Some people don't like guitars in church, but they're not evil. <laughs> they're not really evil. Um, they may not be well-tuned, but they're not evil. And the only other thing I know, I know church music, and I know children's books, because I had written a dissertation on them. And I wrote them, and I studied them, and I taught them. And I thought, where's the evil in children's books? I mean, that's the whole point. They're, they're for children. There is no evil. And then I had a vision. I had this vision. I had always expected, as a good Catholic boy, that someday the Virgin Mary would come out of the clouds and bless me. And I heard, I heard some music, and I looked up, and angels were going, ha, ah, ah, ha, ah, ah, ha, ah. ha, and I looked up, and it wasn't the Virgin Mary, it was the Wicked Witch of the West. And she was saying, I'll get you! And, you and I thought, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I have had my vision. It's like the last line into the lighthouse. I have had my vision, says, says Lily Briscoe. I've had my vision. Everybody knows who the Wicked Witch of the West is. Her name is Wicked with a capital W. Yes. I mean, you can't get any more obvious. The God is talking to me. And I also knew my L. Frank Baum, and I knew he was not... He was not a historian the way C.S. Lewis was or Tolkien. He was more a nonsense writer. He was more like Edward Lear um, or like Lewis Carroll, which he emulated. But the Wicked Witch of the West was there for the taking. And as soon as she came through the door of the saloon, I said, I know who I'm going home with. <laughs> Good questions. We have time for one or two more, I think, if there are any. As you know, I, I, I don't have much editorial function, so you can ask anything you we want. We have one, time for one more question. Right here. Um, probably a, a classic question, but I always like to hear about the writer's process. So how you write, when you write, where you find inspiration. So the question is about his process, when, where, how do you write? Well, as you've heard, the, the, um, the how has to do with how anxious I am. And since I am a, a person who thinks everything that goes wrong in the world is my personal fault, means I'm always anxious, which means I'm always writing. It, it, is just, it really is therapy. It's how I dissipate my, my sense of I can't, control, I can't control climate warming. I can't con control what's happening in politics. I can't control the loss of trust in our institutions. Uh, so what can I? I can, I can take care of my babies. You know, I can take care of my kids. I can take care of the stories in my head. And in taking care of them, I retain a fiction of competence, <laughs> a fiction of parental competence. So that's really, that's really why. Um, the how is, I can do it anywhere. I, I, I sat down in, um, in the little kitchenette 
with the giant refrigerator and the tiny microwave. <laughs> <laughs> and I took out my, my, my computer and I worked on a couple paragraphs you know, between 6.30 and 10 of 7 when Jared arrived. And I can do it anywhere because I just carry, I carry my need with me. And at this point, I carry my facility as well. But that's from a lifetime of, of trying. Thank you so much. That's a really good question. I have to, before, before we do signing, I have to just show you this, though, because I thought, I don't have any props today. But then it was raining out. And I thought, OK. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And it says, somewhere here, I think it says, it's supposed to say, careful, my dear, mustn't get oh, wet. It's on the other, it's right there. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, never, I don't actually use this, but I do bring it for a prop. Everybody gets night. an umbrella. Yay! <laughs> Kristen, bring the umbrellas in. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Really, so much fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And we, and we didn't even talk about the ABC miniseries, but that's for another time. Oh, well. They'll have us back, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And thank Lisa. Lisa, thank you for, for the invitation. Allison, for setting everything up. I know this is a, a wonderful thing to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Concord Authors Festival. So, appreciate it. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Oh, thank you so much. Oh, I'm so glad, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much. I thought you'd be here, Lara, but yeah. <laughs>